during Sam Houston's brawl with William Stanberry, the Ohio legislator drew a pistol, stuck the muzzle in Houston's rib, and squeezed the trigger. The weapon misfired. Had Stanberry been more attentive to his flint, he might have greatly altered the course of Texas and American history. Judge William Cranch subsequently fined Houston $500 for walloping Stanberry with a walking stick. Big drunk never paid the judgment. Instead, he turned his back on the fuss and intrigue of American politics, spurred his horse toward the setting sun, and pitched into the fuss and intrigue of Mexican politics. During his journey, Houston enjoyed the company of his friend, Elias Rector. Just before Houston crossed the Red River, Rector offered his friend a token of his regard, but was ashamed that he had nothing to give him but his old razor. Houston accepted the souvenir with good grace, replying, Rector, I accept your fine gift. And mark my words, if I have luck, this razor will someday shave the chin of a president of a republic. Houston had never set eyes on Texas, but already did he nurture dreams of becoming the head of a republic that existed only inside his head. His timing was impeccable. The same month that Houston led out for Texas, December 1832, Bustamante tumbled from power in Mexico City. His influence had been dwindling, and not wishing to end up on the business end of a firing squad, he reached out to his Federalist rival, offering a truce. Santana acquiesced. Late in December, Bustamante, Santana, and Gomez Pedraza signed the agreements of Zavaleta. Although Gomez Pedraza was a centralist, Santana insisted that he assume the presidency. He had, after all, won the election of 1828. Honoring his part of the deal, Bustamante went into quiet exile. Mexicans once more lauded Santana for his sense of fairness and lack of ambition. They may have forgotten that Gomez Pedraza's term expired the following April, and no matter who sat astride the presidential saddle, Santana gripped the reins. Back in Texas, December was also an eventful month. Right before Christmas, the Central Committee, appointed during the October conclave, called another convention to convene in San Felipe on April 1st. With Bustamante removed, the committee was confident that Mexico City would be more amenable to what most delegates believed were perfectly sensible requests. Yet many Tejanos, and even some more temperate Texians, blasted the committee's defiance one columnist denounced the caucus as the Junto of San Felipe. Had they learned nothing from the refutation of the Convention of 1832? Texian delegates ignored the grumbling. Next time, they swore, no minor Mexican minion would thwart their endeavors. Texas municipalities dispatched 56 delegates to the April Convention, where they addressed the same concerns of the previous October. The two meetings would, however, differ greatly in their tone. This time, the president of the convention was not the accommodating Stephen F. Austin, but the provocative William H. Wharton. Unlike the previous conclave, San Antonio de Bear also sent delegates, including James Bowie, 
one of the ringleaders of the Battle of Nacogdoches. Cheering on William H. Wharton were other malcontents, including little brother John, New Jersey native and former filibuster David G. Burnett, and representing Nacogdoches residents, the newly arrived Sam Houston. The citizens of that Redlands community thought themselves fortunate to have a former Tennessee governor attending their interest. The brothers Wharton also appreciated having such a resourceful accomplice. Representatives at the 1833 convention again insisted on the separation of Cahuilla and Tejas. Amazingly obliging, they went so far as to draft a constitution for the yet unsanctioned state. None other than Sam Houston chaired the committee to draft the new charter. In his letter of the previous June, but one summoning Houston to Texas, John A. Wharton had been remarkably prophetic. As far as the war party was concerned, Houston truly did supply more service than any other man. Delegates again demanded that government officials rescind the injunction against American immigration and revoke customs duties. They also entreated supplementary guards against Indian raids and further required that administrators install a more effectual method of mail delivery. Houston's committee carved into the state's constitution a pledge of free public education. Conventioners also drew up a 27-article Bill of Rights. That document's language parroted the first eight amendments to the United States Constitution. In his characterization of Norte Americanos, Mier Itaran had been spot on. Apparently, they really did go about with their constitution in their pocket, complete with the Bill of Rights. Recollecting the outcome of the Convention of 1832, the Wharton faction called for the immediate and unilateral enactment of the propositions. Austin and the moderates, now branded the Peace Party, voted down that proposal, and the majority decided to offer their new petition to the Mexican Congress for its consideration. Stung by their defeat on this issue, agents of the War Party forced a pledge that if the Mexican Congress refused their demands, the body would take autonomous action. Finally, delegates elected Austin, Erasmo Seguin, and Dr. James Miller to convey their appeals to Mexico City. Although the influential Seguin had not been present at the conference, delegates trusted that Austin could prevail upon him to join on the long and difficult journey. The involvement of a token Tejano might help convince Congress that native-born Mexicans also supported the recommendations of the 1833 convention, which most did not. As it happened, Seguin wanted no part of the proceedings, and Dr. Miller begged off to contend with a cholera epidemic, leaving Stephen F. Austin to make the journey alone. While the petition's confrontational tenor horrified the impresario, he believed that he had no alternative but to represent the will of his constituents. Austin understood he was under the microscope. One of the established Anglo colonists neatly summed up Austin's predicament. He is closely watched, and his future prospects depend greatly upon his conduct in this matter. If he succeeds, he will do well for himself. And 
If for the want of proper exertion on his part, the application should fail, Colonel Austin will be a ruined man in Texas. As Stephen F. Austin spurred his mule toward Mexico City, the eyes of Texas were upon him.